there we go. Hopefully now everybody can see the actual PowerPoint rather than my script. There we go. Okay, so welcome to the 2020 webinar from Adam Matthew Digital. Happy New Year to those of us who have celebrated it already. In today's webinar, we are going to be exploring all of the new collections that are being published by Adam Matthew Digital this year, some of which are new modules for collections that you are going to recognise, and some of which are brand new to all of us, both of which equally exciting. Now, I have got a little bit of housekeeping to get through uh, already, so hopefully anybody who is running late will be able to join just as we get started on all of that fabulous new content. So, some of that housekeeping. Obviously, this webinar is being recorded, so do be aware of that. We do intend to send out a recording uh, with captions after the webinar, so everybody who signed up should also receive that. Now, that also means that if you have any issues with your internet connections or sound during the webinar, you should be able to hear everything on the recording and you won't miss anything. Now, for anyone who hasn't used GoToWebinar before, you will hopefully have a little panel like this on your screen. Everybody apart from me is muted at the moment, but we have the chat function at the bottom, just where you can see uh, the questions. So we would love to hear your thoughts on the collections while we go along. And obviously, if you have any actual questions during the webinar, please do feel free to pop those into the questions tab, and we will get to them in a Q&A session at the end of the webinar today. Now, if you have any technical issues, please do also feel free to pop a question in. I have the wonderful Holly from our marketing team on the webinar with me today, and she will be help, able to help with a whole host of technical issues. However, the one that we find tends to be most common is uh, issues around audio. So you will note that I have popped in some information about how to change your audio settings on this slide here. Hopefully anybody who cannot hear me say that will be able to see on this slide a couple of different ways to change their audio settings. Now, for anybody who is joining today's webinar who hasn't heard of Adam Matthew Digital before and is coming along for the first time, Adam Matthew Digital are a publisher of digital primary sources for teaching and research. We work with archives, libraries and museums around the globe uh, and we digitise their content and we build collections that showcase that material. Now these collections contain sc digital scans of millions of pages of historical documents including diaries, letters, surveys, government reports, maps, films, audio recordings and much much more. It would take an entire webinar to list out all of the different types of sources that we've digitised. Now Specifically, today's uh, showcase is, uh, sorry, today's webinar is a showcase of all of the collections publishing this year. Um, and they're going to be presented by our editorial team. I am your moderator today. My name is Doc Kelly, and I'm a product specialist in the outreach team at Adam Matthew. So I work with libraries and faculty all around the world to help them support research and teaching with these Adam Matthew collections. Now, I am joined by six of my colleagues from the editorial department. So we're gonna have Alex Barr taking you through a new module coming to Colonial Caribbean. That'll be the second module for Colonial Caribbean, Colonial Government and Abolition. And that covers the period 1833 to 1849. Then we're gonna have Jade Bailey, who will be talking to us about the new module coming to East India Company. I believe that's the second part of the IOR slash E class material. Then we've got Emma Woodcock talking to us about the Foreign Office Files for Southeast Asia. That's the 1963 to 1980 content, focusing on the foundations of economic growth and industrialization. Then we have Lauren Clinch, who's gonna start us off with some interwar culture which is a collection of popular and lesser known periodicals, all published in the 1920s. Then my colleague Rosie Perry is gonna talk us through some of the fascinating content from Life at Sea, seafaring in the Anglo-American maritime. Next up, we have Sarah Burse talking about a new module of Mass Observation Project. That's the third module of Mass Observation Project, focusing on the 2000s, diving into some incredibly recent history there. And then finally, last but by no means least, then we have Rachel Gardner-Stevens rounding us off talking about Victorians on film. So we have 
a lot to get through. And without further ado, I'm going to pass us straight over to our first speaker, Alex Barr. Alex, what I'm going to do is just give you the keyboard and mouse. So hopefully you'll be able to click through all of these screens yourself. Just let me know if you're okay to do that, Alex. Yeah, yeah thank you, Dots. Yeah, it looks like I've got control now. So hi, everyone. I'm Alex. I am an assistant editor here in editorial production, and I'm project lead on uh, Colonial Caribbean, Colonial Government and Abolition, which covers the years 1833 to 1849. So as Dot has said, this is the second module of our Colonial Caribbean series, uh, the first of which published in September last year. Uh, there we go. Um, so I thought I'd start off with just a kind of overview of Colonial Caribbean as a whole. So this is bringing together British government records from uh, 27 different file classes from the National Archives here in the UK, mostly from the Colonial Office series. Uh, these documents are mostly letters from uh, local governors and government officers. And they really allow users to delve into the administration of British colonial rule in the Caribbean. But they do also, these volumes do also include a wealth of letters, petitions, and other documents from private individuals, which may, may offer a look at the more everyday life and concerns of, the, of people in the Caribbean. And so the documents in the resource will allow users to study slavery from prominence to abolition in the broader context of colonial rule. Um, so as I've said, slavery is a very key topic in colonial Caribbean, uh, but we are trying to offer a really comprehensive look at, at, the at the British Caribbean. So as you can see on the themes on the right here, uh, you can see we're exploring everything from finance and economy, trade and shipping, uh, to religion, uh, crime and punishment, and very excitingly, piracy and privateering. Uh, before I go on, it is worth noting that uh, the documents in the resource are written from the perspective of white colonial uh, kind of elite and may not uh, provide a fair or accurate depiction of those outside or that group or of um, minority voices. And so we're thinking very carefully about how we approach diversity and representation in the resource. So uh, we've had frank discussions in the team taking on board uh, input from our diversity and representation working group and the editorial boards to think about the language and terminology we use in the resource. And we're trying to be as transparent as possible with that. So we've included a, a statement on language and terminology in the, in the kind of introduction to the uh, website. Uh, we're also drawing out secondary features that will, we hope will identify hidden narratives and attempt to address biases within the documents. So for those of you who are experienced with module one, we'll know that uh, Dr. Christy Warren from the University of Leicester produced a fantastic video on hidden voices in the archive and how we might identify and learn from them. So we're hoping to really uh, take those lessons and, uh, and discuss them in the projects. Uh, so some of the key features of Colonial Caribbean. So we're offering uh, multiple access points into the documents so that users from different backgrounds or with different amounts of experience can really delve in and ex explore the, the different documents. So uh, for example, a, re a veteran researcher, very experienced with the, uh, the National Archives files will perhaps prefer to use the file class to browse through it, whereas an, an undergraduate might find it easier to browse by colony or by theme. We're also attempting to improve browsing and navigation. So the vast majority of documents in the resource will be sectioned, uh, which will improve navigability and help, help users to go straight to the, the bits that they want. We're also improving searching with our metadata, but very excitingly with HTR and HTR transcription, which will make these documents more searchable than ever before. And I know, for example, some of our editorial boards have been using this to great effects already in module one. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we've got a vast variety of secondary features. So we've got essays that go into depth on complex and interesting topics 
trying to interrogate biases and draw out hidden stories. We've got editors' choice written by our team, where our editors write about topics they find interesting, and again, help us to draw out interesting narratives. And as well, we've got a wealth of contextualizing pieces that will make the resource valuable to a whole broad range of different users. So focusing in now on module two, uh, so those of you who know module one will know that it covered nearly 200 years of, uh, of Caribbean history, whereas the second module is really zooming in on just the 16 year period. Look, and in particular, we're looking at, um, at the abolition of slavery, which came into effect in 1834, and the immediate effects. So while abolition came into effect in 1834, it carried on, uh, slavery carried on in uh, de facto until 1838 under the apprenticeship scheme, whereby former enslaved people were forced to continue working without compensation. Um, and this amounted to essentially a continuation of slavery. But this is resisted by the apprentices and by abolition group, whose pressure helps to bring this scheme to an early end in 1838. And after this, after this period ends, we start to see colonies go in divergent uh, paths. So some islands, such as Jamaica, where there were small populations and there was lots of land available, former enslaved people were able to claim land for themselves, establish small holding communities. But on other islands, such as Barbados, where all the land was given over to plantations and there was little opportunity for work, these uh, there, there was little opportunity for other work. So uh, 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 the former enslaved people often remained in these regimented pla plantations. And these islands also turned to alternative sources of labour. So we start to see. Uh, indentured labour coming in from Asia and from Africa. Uh, we do uh, need to acknowledge that while abolition was a very important moment in the period, in many ways it didn't change life in the Caribbean. So the kind of structures and hierarchies of colonialism were still in place, but just redefined. And so the, the government in the Caribbean often takes on new roles and reorganises itself to enforce those old structures. Um, I thought just to end with, I'd go through a few uh, documents to showcase how we might ex examine them and how, how we might draw out narratives. Uh, so these are just a very brief highlight from a very rich and varied resource. It wouldn't be possible to go through all the different document types or stories in the time we've got. So just to start with, I've got two um, documents where we've been able to identify underrepresented voices and learn about people from outside of the colonial elite. So on the left here, we've got an address written by, in their words, the, the free colored inhabitants of the island of New Providence. And on the right, we've got a petition from former enslaved people in Jamaica. So from these documents, we're able to learn about the people involved in the Caribbean and we are able to learn about their lives. Uh, the petition on the right is a particularly vivid depiction of life for uh, former enslaved people. So that just as a quote from it, uh, your petitioners have been so repeatedly defrauded by the planters of their time and have no redress for they themselves are the dispensers of justice. So they, both these documents are appeal, appealing for rights um, to be ex extended across the whole free population of the Caribbean. And they paint a story of how people in the Cari Caribbean resisted against colonial structures and sought to establish their own rights. Uh, that's just an example of how we can identify uh, underrepresented voices, but uh, there's a whole wealth of documents within uh, colonial Caribbean that can draw out these stories. But we do need to then say the majority of documents in the resource are written by government officials and um, 
again, I've got a couple of examples here. The, uh, we are able to identify some interesting and uh, minority voices in these here. So uh, th this middle one, for example, is a governor forwarding documents about someone who's going through hardship. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that these are um, are potentially biased documents and may not uh, tell the whole story. And just as the last one, uh, statistics, I'm not very good at maths, but someone who's, very, who's much better at it will love these. Uh, Sea Caribbean has a wealth of statistics on a huge range of topics. Uh, so we've got um, uh, election results going from Jamaica, which then further breaks it down by parishes and um, showing the number of enslaved, former enslaved people in each parish. Uh, in the top right, we've got uh, returns, again, from Jamaica, showing the amounts of produce, so sugar, rum, and molasses exported from different estates in Jamaica. And the bottom right is a financial document from uh, the West India Bank. So comparing different statistics from across the resource might allow users to perform quantitative or longitudinal, longitudinal analysis of life in the Caribbean. Um, and again, this is supported by HPR searching, which will allow, which will uh, help users to find these statistics. Um, and I think that was my last slide. So we we'll move on. Perfect. Thanks very much, Alex. Okay, so next up, we're going to have Jade Bailey. So Jade is going to be talking to us about the new module that is coming to East India Company. Uh, and I'm going to give her control now. Jade, if you want to give that a go, you should be able to move my mouse. That's looking good. Thanks, Dot. Um, Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jade Bailey. Uh, I'm an assistant editor at Adam Matthew and uh, I am the products, the project lead for um, East India Company IORE2. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more about this product. Um, so East India Company is one of our flagship products. Um, I'm sure for many of you it needs no introduction. It's a massive scale project that has been running since 2015 to digitise the records of the East India Company, which are held at the British Library. The resulting online resource, East India Company, India Office Records from the British Library, 1599 to 1947, um, is being published in modules, the first of which came out in 2017. Uh, and uh, from the company's charter in 1600 all the way through to Indian independence in 1947. This product tells the story of uh, trade with the East, politics, the rise and fall of the British Empire. Uh, it records the challenges of a globalizing world and sheds light on many contrasting narratives from records of powerful political figures through to the lives of the native populations and the individual traders who lived and worked um, at the edge of the British Empire. Uh, so East India Company has been divided into modules, as I mentioned, according to the series classification of the India Office records. Uh, currently, um, we're working on the Series E, which uh, largely comprises correspondence between the East India Company, uh, British and European governments and agencies, and also the company settlements across South Asia. Uh, Dot, I'm having trouble moving to, ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, just took a moment. Um, okay, so uh, the current module, which is uh, module five of East India Company, but module two of the IORE components, um, is called Correspondence, Domestic Life, Governance and Territorial Expansion. Uh, so it's the second module of the IORE collection, which stems from the 17th through to the 19th centuries. 
the first module, uh, Correspondence, Early Voyages, Formation and Conflict, was uh, published in 2020. And uh, this module, uh, Correspondence, Domestic Life, Governance and Territorial Expansion, uh, is due for release in October this year. So this module uh, features correspondence between the East India Company and British government departments and the East India Company's Bombay and Madras presidencies. This is in addition to the Home Correspondence Series, um, IORE 1, which contains letters between company officials and merchants, traders officials and members of the general public. So these documents cover a range of themes, uh, some of which include but are not limited to um, administrative and ecclesiastical appointments, agriculture, charters and the East India Company's relationship to the uh, English British Crown, um, courts and legal affairs including legislation, trade, warfare and military matters, diplomacy, treaties and ambassadorial expeditions, finance and debt, the machinery of government, pays and pensions for company servants and their families, railways, transportation and all, all kinds of things. So these documents um, obviously covering a very wide range of themes touch on some, some key narratives including the growth of diplomatic and trading relations between Britain, Africa and Asia, including India, China, Japan, the Middle East and the Spice Islands during the 17th and 18th centuries. The East India Company's emergence as a trading and territorial power in India and the growth of its financial, political, military, judicial and other governmental functions uh, and its operation prior to the creation of the India office in 1858. Uh, also, uh, British government oversight of the East India Company through the Board of Control, which was established in 1784. Uh, maritime trade and life at sea during the 17th and 18th centuries, um, including piracy. Uh, emergence and expansion of European empires in Asia. Relations between European powers and the Muslim world. So uh, I'm not going to read through this, but this just gives you um, a breakdown of the documents that are included in this particular module of um, uh, the, uh, the East India Company. So we've got the, um, the IORE 4 was split between module 4, which is uh, the, the most recent module that's been published, and this module, and this covers correspondence with India between 1703 and 1858 and uh, in addition to that we are introducing a new category which is IORE 1 home correspondence from 1699 to 1859 and I will explain that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so home correspondence, uh, this is, as I say, this is a new addition to the uh, collection. So this shelf mark uh, comprises two different categories of correspondence um, of the East India Company covering the period from the early 18th to the mid 19th centuries. Uh, so there's two, the, these two different categories are the miscellaneous letters received um, and copies um, miscellaneous letters received and miscellanies, apologies. So just to explain a little bit more about the difference between these two. Um, so the miscellaneous letters received um, comprises uh, letters received from members of the public. Um, so this could include tradespeople, sailors, ships captains, ordinary men and women with a whole range of different reasons for wanting to get in touch with the East India Company. So inquiries uh, could cover everything from trade and shipping to corruption and piracy. Uh, we're very fortunate with this particular collection of documents in that um, we have detailed metadata available for these um, which hasn't been available for any other um, 
shelf mark in the IOR collection. And this has allowed us to produce a detail, a really detailed breakdown letter by letter of these documents. So they are they are fantastically searchable. Um, they're really, really a really great, rich addition to the resource. Um, and in order to sort of support this, we've uh, commissioned an essay which will focus on research approach, approaches to this material and will really explore um, the, the valuable insights that these letters give us into how this incredibly uh, large and powerful organization interacted with members of the general public. Um, alongside this, we also have the miscellanies. Now, this is correspondence sent by the East India Company in India to agents, officials and government departments abroad. Uh, and this is uh, anyone who is um, familiar with the previous module in East India Company will find that this is very familiar. It's very much the same uh, sort of material, but it uh, provides kind of fresh insight into the company's dealings with its own management and also with the British government. Hi, Jade. I think we're going to have to uh, just jump on to the next person, unfortunately. Um, yeah, do you want to no round up with the last kind of 10 seconds? Yeah, that's no problem. Uh, I'm just going to move to the next slide, which I think was my last one. OK, there we go. Um, so, yeah, just very, very quickly, just talking about the two new essays that we're going to be adding alongside this material. So, as mentioned, we've got a really wonderful overview um, from Beverly Lemire covering um, the miscellaneous letters received and really getting to grips with the new content there. And we've also got um, another essay um, exploring the hidden voices uh, of colonial India and how these records can be used to sort of read against the grain to bring out those narratives. And that's it. Perfect. Thanks ever so much, Jade. OK, next up, we have the wonderful Emma, who is going to be talking to us about foreign office files for Southeast Asia. Emma, I am handing you the power now. Thank you, Dot. OK. Um, so hopefully that will switch over. Foreign Office Files for Southeast Asia 2, which has the subtitle Foundations of Economic Growth and Industrialization, follows on chronologically from the first module, um, which was published in February 2020. Module 2 comprises documents from the FCO 15 and FCO 24 file classes at the National Archives UK, which span 1967 to 1980. Like module one, the files concern the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore. The period covered by this module was one of immense change and development across Southeast Asia. Documents can be used to follow the narratives from module one into the next decade and study how the political and economic climates of Southeast Asia evolved through the late 1960s and 1970s. Southeast Asia is cross-searchable with other collections on the Archives Direct platform. All documents are also full text searchable and the collection's popular searches have been updated to make the new content more discoverable. Events of the decades covered by this collection occurred against a backdrop of the British decision in 1967 to withdraw its armed forces from military bases in Southeast Asia by 1971. Following this decision, the five power defence agreement was set up between Australia, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore and the United Kingdom to provide defensive cooperation between the nations. This significant shift in Britain's role and influence in the region, its administration and its impact is charted in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office files in this collection. The period covered by this module also saw the foundation of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, a union which promotes economic growth in the region, as well as external relations and globalization. There was increased investment from Britain and other nations during this period as Southeast Asian economies and industries began to solidify and grow. The British government's perspective on and involvement in these investment schemes features in a number of documents in this module. I'll move on to the next slide, actually. Largely categorised by country, 
the files in this collection can be used to study individual nations or to compare the narratives across the region in the 1960s and 70s. Documents relating to the Philippines extensively discuss evolving British responses to Ferdinand Marcos's presidency and the impact of his imposition of martial law on the country in 1972, as well as political relations between the Philippines and neighbouring countries. Coverage of Indonesia traces the rule of Suharto as president after the fall of Sukarno in 1967 and his implementation of the so-called New Order. Documents offer commentary on the internal political it, it, sorry, the internal political and economic situation of the country, the status of UK aid in Indonesia, the invasion of East Timor in 1975, and cases of political detainees under Suharto. Documents relating to Malaysia chart the continuation of tension over its independence, as well as ongoing issues with race relations and rising concerns over communism in the nation. The collection also includes perspectives on Tun Abdul Razak's leadership and his administration's new economic policy, which led to industrial and economic growth. Having gained independence from Malaysia in 1965, the decade Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew's premiership was focused on economic growth and attracting industry. In the period covered by this resource, the nation received significant foreign investment and was able to capitalise on its port system and advantageous location to produce year-on-year -year growth in GDP. In terms of document highlights, and some of the quotes on the screen are just kind of insights into the, how these different themes um, are presented in the documents. I've touched on a number of the fascinating themes and narratives possible to study through these documents. Extensive coverage of the Marcos regime opens the British government's perspective on his presidency up to researchers. A number of documents also offer commentary on changing political relations between Southeast Asian nations and other countries, including the UK, USSR and United States. Although focused on one geographic area, therefore, the collection aids researchers studying how the place of Southeast Asia was changing on a global scale. Another important area to be examined within these documents is the British withdrawal from Southeast Asia, its mechanics and its impact. As legacies of empire are more closely studied, these documents offer researchers a lens through which to consider the changing role of Britain across the world in the 20th century. I think that is all from me. Um, so I'll pass back to you and thank you for your time. Amazing. Thank you ever so much, Emma. OK, next up we have Lauren and Lauren is going to talk to us about the first module of the brand new interwar culture. Just give me two seconds. And hopefully, Lauren, you should be able to move that mouse. Yeah, all looks good. Thank you, Doc. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Lauren Clinch and I am an assistant editor here at Adam Matthew. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Interwar Culture 1919 to 1929, which is publishing in just a few short weeks. Uh, this is a very exciting project that aims to support research into the lives, experiences and events of the very unique interwar period uh, through the periodicals that both captured and shaped its popular consciousness. This is the first of two modules, the second of which will cover the 1930s. And it is also Adam Matthews first ever resource consisting entirely of periodicals. Uh, these have been sourced from five source archives across the UK and America, uh, the British Library, New York Public Library, the Newbury Library, Liverpool John Moores University and magazine publisher Future PLC. There are complete runs of available material within our date range, with a very small number of exceptions, only where volumes are not in a stable enough condition to be digitised or they are missing from the original archive collection. This means that we have 381 volumes presented in this module alone. This includes some incredibly well-known titles such as American Magazine, The Strand, Time and Tide and Homes and Gardens, as well as some hidden gems previously unavailable for online research, such as Peg's Paper or The Label Woman. Oh, sorry, it's just skipped on one there. Let me backtrack. There we are. Um, in terms of study interests, this is a vastly interdisciplinary resource. The material is categorised into the 10 key research themes you see here, which 
aim to very broadly reflect a turbulent and dynamic decade that saw just for example women win the vote in the US, the formation of the BBC, the Irish War of Independence, Charles Lindbergh's non-stop flight across the Atlantic, the Prohibition Act, the first talking pictures and of course the very first appearance of Mickey Mouse. There really is something for everyone in this resource, whether that's guidance on the correct clothing for a day of golfing, debates on the latest welfare laws, or the hottest gossip on your favourite movie stars. Interval culture is unlike any other periodical resource currently available online. It is highly browsable, with material presented as close to original reading order as possible. You can choose the browsing style that best suits your research, whether that's by periodical, or by individual issues for a more granular approach. Volumes are fully sectioned as well, which allows you to jump between issues with a single click. And we also have clickable contents lists within each volume that will take you directly to your chosen article, which you can see an example of here on the right. Uh, what's more, we have a literary contributor search tool allowing you to easily search the periodicals by key authors of the decade, such as H.G. Wells, Vera Britton and Arthur Conan Doyle, amongst roughly 800 others. Uh, this is all designed to make the periodicals as browsable and user-friendly as possible for students and experienced researchers alike. I think it's fair to say that literature is one of the highlights of internal culture, uh, with periodicals targeting a very broad spectrum of audiences. Chums, Schoolgirls Weekly and The Modern Boy provide fantastic insight into children's literature of the era, while Peg's Paper and Woman's Weekly, amongst several others, exemplify the more sensationalist fiction of periodicals aimed at a more working class audience. And while The Dial addressed a more highbrow intellectual audience, Titles such as Time and Tide and The Strand championed a middle brow literary culture that became increasingly popular throughout the 20s. Oh, it skipped on again just one second. There we go. Uh, finally, I would like to just leave you with some final visuals from interwar culture. I think I've already highlighted some of my favourite covers throughout these slides, but I cannot stress enough just how beautiful interwar culture is. The whole collection is a treasure trove of art and design that showcases, I think, the best of the 1920s, from beautifully illustrated front covers and photography, as you see there on the left, to advertisements and some truly stunning fashion plates. Um, but that's all from me. I hope this has been interesting for everyone, and I'll hand back to you, Dot. Amazing. Those are some fantastic images, Lauren. OK, right. Next up, we have, I believe, Rosie Perry, who is going to be talking about life at sea. Rosie, give me two seconds and I will give you the power. There you go. Ah, Rosie, I think you might still be muted. Let me help with I that. Will. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Dot. I don't know whether I unmuted and you unmuted at the same time, but here we go. Um, hi, everyone. Yes, as Dot says, I'm here to introduce Life at Sea to you all, um, a resource that I am thoroughly enjoying working on, um, and I can't wait to, to bring it to publication later in the year. Um, so this resource is going to explore the life of seafarers in the Anglo-American maritime world, reflecting current trends in maritime history. It's taking a socio-cultural approach, so a really bottom-up approach, um, focusing on the individual experiences and personal narratives of seafarers. The resource is going to draw material from both the US and the UK. Um, so the primary source content in this resource has been drawn from four partner archives, as you can see on the screen there. So two in the UK, the National Archives at Kew and the National Maritime Museum Greenwich, and then two in the US, the Massachusetts Historical Society and Mystic Seaport Museum. Both the nature and the scope of this resource has been influenced by our editorial board with members across both the UK and the US. So here I break down the key collections um, and you really get a sense of the type of content we've drawn from each archive. 
As a core objective of the resource is to uncover the lies of the ordinary seafarer, the focus is very much on the type of documents that will facilitate that. As you can see, journals and diaries, logbooks, they all form a large bulk of the resource, 38% um, in fact, followed by correspondence and memoirs. These documents are often vividly descriptive as well as richly illustrated, offering wonderful insights into life at sea during the age of sail. You can see one illustration there on the left that's from one of the journals of Edward Cree and I have to say just yeah throughout working on this project I'm repeatedly blown away by the beautiful illustrations that are coming across. From the National Archives are also including a selection of court martial records from 1750 to 1850 from the ADM1 series as well as, well as material from HCA1 and HCA13, examinations of pirates and other criminals and prize instance books. Again, these allow a study of the life of a wide variety of sailors and seafarers through their personal defence testimonies. All of these documents will facilitate a study of a broad range of themes, um, including recruitment, discipline and punishment, health and welfare, leisure, maritime trade, whaling, piracy. Again, that's the third time piracy has been mentioned in this webinar, I think. Shipwrecks and disasters, port life and life ashore, and women and the sea. All of this fantastic material will be made searchable by HTRT, which we hope will allow users to dig deep into these sources and pull out perhaps previously hidden aspects of the maritime experience during this period. We'll also be supplementing the primary source content with a range of commissioned contextual essays and video interviews based on the key themes that I've just mentioned. In terms of document highlights, ooh, um, there are so many, it's hard to choose, but um, we'll be including depositions um, in the Admiralty, Admiralty, that's a tongue twister, courts martial records, providing incredible insight into everyday life aboard British naval vessels, including recorded conversations between sailors and their testimonies. And these really do give a, a rare glimpse into daily life on the lower decks. Um, as well as that, the complete court, um, High Court of Admiralty examinations of the pirates, as I've mentioned, are really are a key source for studying the golden age of piracy. Um, and on the screen there, you can see on the left, that's a screenshot from a court martial from ADM1. And then on the right, a front cover of um, one of the examinations. As I said, we also have a selection of personal journals, um, and these are, yeah, some real highlights. So these illustrations on the screen now um, are a mixture from Edward Cree, who was a ship surgeon, and from Gabriel Gray, who um, was a lieutenant. And these are just uh, a few examples of the really rich illustrations you'll find within Life at Sea. Um, they really do give a fantastic insight into what life was like on board some of these ships. I've also included um, some other examples of some of the beautiful um, material that we've had in so far. We haven't got a lot of it yet, but what we have had is absolutely stunning. Um, so examples here include um, at the bottom, a journal kept and illustrated by Elizabeth Hornby during her father's tenure um, as Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Station um, and she drew lots of wonderful um, illustrations of, of sailors going about their everyday work. Um, in the top right we have an illustration from a logbook um, of the whaling vessel the Clara Bell. Um, in the centre that's an image, not a digitised image, that's a photograph taken by one of our development editors when they were on an assessment trip. But that's a photograph um, of a journal kept and illustrated, uh, sorry, a journal of William Benjamin Gold, um, who was a formerly enslaved and a veteran of the American Civil War serving in the US Navy. His diary is one of only a few written during the Civil War by former slaves that survived and the only one of a formerly enslaved sailor. So lots of really interesting content um, and there's lots more to come this year. And that is my final slide. So I'll hand back over to you, Dot. Thank you ever so much, Rosie. Okay, um, we are just about to introduce Sarah Burst, who is going to be talking to us about Mass Observation Project, Module 3, the 2000s. Sarah, you should have the ability to move that mouse. 
Thanks, Dot. That looks super. Hi, yes. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be talking to you about the new mass observation module, which is publishing this spring. Following the publication of the previous two modules over the last two years, which covered the 1980s and 1990s, we're now adding the material collected at the University of Sussex for the 2000s. In addition, we're also publishing the Silver Jubilee collection from 1977. The Mass Observation Project is a unique life writing project about everyday life in Britain. I don't appear to have made the slide on. There we go. So, um, it's a unique life writing project um, about everyday life in Britain, capturing the thoughts and experiences of everyday people in the 20th and 21st century. So it was launched in 1981 by the University of Sussex and is a rebirth of the 1937 project that recorded wartime Britain. Uh, the, pub, the, um, the project continues to commission new research and is a valuable resource for research, teaching and learning. It's one of the major repositories of longitudinal qualitative social data in the UK. Unlike the project that ran from the 1930s to the 1960s, which was a mixture of observations from recruited observers, diaries and directives, directives being very open-ended questionnaires on specific topics. When mass observation relaunched in 1981, they decided to focus on commissioning and gathering responses purely through the directives. This means the project is a dialogue between the mass observation panel at the university, composing and sending out the directives, and the observers sending back their responses. During this period, directives were sent out seasonally, seasonally usually three times a year during spring, summer and autumn winter. If something happened that the panelists wanted the observers immediate thoughts on, then a special directive would be sent out um, a really good example of this in the 2000s was following the attacks of September 11th. During the 2000s, 30 directives were sent out, and most of these were made up of multiple parts of different topics. By the end of the decade, respondents had been asked about 73 topics in total, and this module contains the 15,500 responses received. As with the previous modules, each response has been individually indexed and matched with biographical data, such as age, region, occupation and marital status, allowing users to filter responses by these. So what were the observers asked about in the 2000s? Well, the directive themes are broad ranging and balanced between the personal, such as your lifeline, your home, having a laugh, age and sex, the political, such as the 2001 general election, the world situation in 2002 and the war in Iraq, and the historical, such as swine flu, the Asian tsunami and the Beijing Olympics. The nature of the project and the large range of themes make it extremely multidisciplinary. Prior to the 1981 relaunch, a modest revival was attempted for the 1977 Silver Jubilee, family has always had an intrinsic link with the mass observation project with the 1981 relaunch timed to capture the wedding of Charles and Diana. Directives on the royals often polarise the observers. The 1977 revival asked volunteers to collect information and observation based on the preparations for the Jubilee celebrations, including street parties and media responses. Approximately 160 responses were received containing newspaper clippings, photographs and opinions from the observers, as well as those they spoke to on the subject. Users of the resource will be able to browse and filter by any particular directive they might be interested in, but also by the observer, as each observer has been assigned a code for anonymity, or they can filter by key biographical data such as all observers born in the 1960s or living in the northeast of England and so on. Users can filter by key topics within the directives as well, which have been assigned by our editorial team. Search capabilities have been improved on all three modules and all documents, including handwritten material, will now be fully searchable at site level. 
alongside the primary source material, uh, contextual features such as essays and interactive chronology and exhibitions will also be available as a starting point for those less familiar with the material. It's been a really fascinating and thought-provoking project to work on, uh, particularly because it's such recent history and we're really looking forward to publishing it in the current weeks. Okay, so Last, but by no means least, we have Rachel Gardner-Stevens. Rachel, I am handing you over. Control. Lovely, thank you very much, Dot. I think I've got control there. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone, for um, sticking around to the bitter end to hear about Victorian film. Um, as Dot mentioned at the beginning, um, my name's Rachel and I'm a publisher in our editorial team. Um, and I've been working on our new film product, Victorians on Film, for the last couple of years. And I'm thrilled to see the platform publish um, in 2022. Um, so Victorians on Film will be a primary source database comprised entirely of film content. Uh, the films will help researchers to study the world of the late Victorians captured by the earliest pioneers of film. Across around a, a thousand films, users will be able to gain insights into filmmaking techniques, uh, the development of film genre and key events in the late Victorian and Edwardian periods. Um, most excitingly, um, I, I think, our students and scholars will be able to um, get a glimpse into the everyday lives of Victorians and Edwardians through the actuality footage, which is a strong feature of this collection. We're excited to work with the British Film Institute again on the single archive resource, um, and the resource will showcase two of British cinema's most important early film archives. Uh, firstly, we'll include the Victorian film collection featuring films created during the late Victorian period 1895 to 1901. Uh, these, these films showcase the incredible range and inventiveness of Britain's dynamic and youthful film pioneers. Um, they experimented with the new medium of film during these first five years, creating news and comedy and drama and fantasy. Um, and crucially, they recorded that world of the late Victorians themselves. And this resource will also feature the extraordinary collection of filmmaking pioneers, uh, Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon. Uh, the Mitchell and Kenyon collection is the largest collection of actuality films in the world, and their work showcases the development of film technologies right through this period and provides further glimpses of ordinary people going about their everyday lives. The range of subjects covered by the films is wide and fascinating, and I've listed a few here on this slide. Um, and they're wonderful films to engage with because so many of them demonstrate firsts in cinema history. We'd like to showcase a few of those firsts now alongside some of the key research themes. So films function as a source of entertainment was recognised very early um, and scholars can identify popular culture trends that influence the, developments film, uh, influence the development of films for enjoyment. Uh, so themes and subjects typically covered by optical devices such as magic lanterns, stereoscopy, panoramas, kinescopes, they can all be seen in these early films, um, such as Fire, a film by James Williamson, um, which features a narrative recognisable from magic lantern sets of um, a policeman discovering a fire and going off to get help. Um, music Hall as well can be seen um, influencing these uh, films, um, as well as vaudeville and other theatres as well. Um, entertainment of Victorian audiences was a huge driver of innovation as filmmakers began experimenting with illusion and editing to create action sequences and drama and suspense and romance as well. Um, there are films of car crashes and explosions and objects appearing and disappearing, uh, early split screen effects and manipulation of viewer perspective. Um, we're going to play you a short film now. Um, Dot, if you wouldn't mind um, getting that one started, and I'll continue talking over the top. That's great. Um, so innovations can be traced um, throughout the collection um, from the very flashy to the seemingly quite minor. And a really fascinating example um, of the latter can be seen in this film that we're showing you now, How It Feels to be Run Over, which was a 1900 film by Cecil Hepworth. Um, 
the premise of this film is uh, the Victorian society was notoriously terrified of cars, um, of the horseless carriages it was called, um, and the impact of our roads. And here Hepworth provides the audience with a frightening first person perspective of what happens when you're mowed down by a reckless driver. Um, there we go. It's not the first first person death scene to be uh, created in cinema, um, but at the end, Hepworth inserts the first known use of intertitles um, as um, "Oh mother, will we please?" kind of sarcastically flashes across the screen. Um, and intertitles become fundamental to silent cinema and newsreels as as filmmaking um, develops. Um, the films in the resource feature early precursors of newsreels as well, um, featuring uh, capturing contemporary events as they happen or recreating them for Victorian audiences. Um, there are multiple films of Queen Victoria, most especially during her 1897 Diamond Jubilee procession and her funeral in 1901. Um, there's also footage of the funeral of Gladstone in 1898 and the coronation of Edward VII slightly later, um, and footage of uh, royal tea parties as well. And films document or they recreate key moments in Britain's imperial history um, with footage of military leaders and operations, um, as well as moments of victory and defeat during the Boer War. Um, the collection includes the first ever film of Queen Victoria, sitting very comfortably in a cart, as you'll see in this slide, um, complete with dog in lap. There are lots of dogs and cats featured throughout this um, collection. Um, it seems as soon as we invented film, uh, we started to um, use them for comedy and filming our pets, which is very relatable. Um, and Victoria recorded in her diary on the day that this was filmed um, that um, it was a wonderful process representing people, representing people and their movements and actions as if they were alive. Um, and everyday life is documented with our actuality footage of factory gates, street scenes, holiday makers at seaside resorts, people walking their dogs, local festivals and visits to the zoo. Um, there are films of football and rugby matches, um, performing gymnasts, bicycle rides through Hyde Park, um, athletics and horse racing as well. One of my particular favourite um, actuality films, um, again I just wanted to show you Dot if you wouldn't mind getting that one started. Um, and this is from the Michelin Kenning collection, and it captures workers leaving the cooperative wholesale, wholesale factory in 1900 in Manchester. Um, Michelin Kenyon specialised in locality film, aiming to capture as many people as possible in their shots. Um, they're famous for their factory gate films. Um, and this example provides a fascinating glimpse of the men, women and children finishing their day, walking, chatting, noticing the camera and reacting to the camera as well. Um, my particular highlight you'll probably see in just a moment is a young woman who approaches the camera arm in arm with her companion um, and then panics at the last minute and hides her face from the camera. Again, a very relatable camera based moment. Um, this film also starts, you'll have um, seen at the beginning, uh, with a showman demonstrating what people should do in front of the camera, which reminds us that the films aren't purely documentary as we understand them. They're aimed at creating moments in time, but they're primarily entertainment. And Mitchell and Kenyon would create the footage and then invite the public to view the films later in the day or the next day, adding a, a slightly performative element to the people on screen, um, which is um, really, really interesting. Um, if you want to pause it and we'll move on to the next slide if that's okay. So the films uh, will be accompanied by a selection of research tools within the resource. Um, these features will place the films in their historical context, highlighting their significance and demonstrating their value for studying Victorian history and culture. Um, we'll include a selection of essays and videos uh, covering British cinema and film consumption, technology and special effects, gender and sexuality, um, an essay that will explore the absence of minority groups within these films, um, local film and class, as well as case studies on using um, film as primary sources. Exhibitions will highlight key innovations, pioneering filmmakers and producers, um, and the early emergence of genre, um, and the beautiful biograph films that will also feature in this resource. 
Um, the films will be enhanced with detailed metadata to ensure the films are as discoverable as possible, and each film will be accompanied by a time-coded audio description transcript as well. Um, so that's everything I wanted to tell you about Victorian film, though I could talk for many hours. Um, but thanks for listening, and I look forward to any questions you have. Amazing. Thank you ever so much, Rachel. OK, so uh, I realise we are running very slightly over time. However, I do want to get through a couple of questions. Um, and if our lovely panellists wouldn't mind popping their cameras on, I will also do so in a show of solidarity here. Um, so we have a few questions. The first which is for, I believe, based on the time. So, Alex, can you confirm uh, are the documents in Colonial Caribbean transcribed? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. We are very excited about HKR in this project and its results. Um, as yet, uh, we are not having transcription alongside uh, the documents. Um, it is running in the background, but uh, Currently, it's not going to be visible. Perfect. OK, there we go. So then it looks like the next question is for Emma. So, Emma, we've had a question here. Do the Adam Matthew files on Southeast Asia currently include Laos, Cambodia, Thailand or Vietnam? Um, the simple answer is no. No, they don't. The, the material selected for this module is just focused on the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia. Perfect. OK, and it looks we've also had one through about Victorians on film. Rachel, could you confirm uh, which regions that collection is going to cover? Stop. Um, it's a pretty varied collection, actually. Um, there's obviously plenty of coverage of London, as it tends to be in Victorian studies, but um, there's a good coverage um, generally of England, Scotland and Wales and a few from Northern Ireland. Um, in particularly in particular northern cities and key industrial towns um, like Bradford, Blackford, uh, Blackburn, Manchester, Salford, um, Glasgow as well um, tend to feature. There's quite a bit of coverage of British coastal towns as well, so you can peek into the leisure lives of Victorians and see some of those extraordinary bathing suits. Um, there are there are quite a few films outside of the UK as well. Um, so Ireland features reasonably regularly throughout the collection. Uh, there are films created in South Africa as well, um, covering the Boer War, um, and there are a couple of films uh, that were created in Australia and France as well. Perfect. OK, we've had another question here. Uh, will interwar culture become part of AM Explorer? So I can answer that question uh, already, which is yes, it will become part of AM Explorer, but it will become part of AM Explorer next year. So if your renewal date is in January, you will get uh, Interwar Culture Module 1 in January of 2023. If your renewal date is in August, you will get that module, that extra content in August of 2023. Um, okay, and then it looks like we've got one final question as well, and this one is for Rodi, and that's, can you find women's voices in Life at Sea? Thanks, Dot. Yes, you can find women's voices in, in Life at Sea. I think you perhaps have to look a little bit harder than to find men's voices in Life at Sea, but we've got some fantastic content written by women. Um, I obviously highlighted one journal in my presentation, but we have plenty of others, including the journal of Emma Hotchkiss, who was the captain's daughter. Um, and we also have plenty of correspondence as well um, from women on board ships, but also from women back at home, wives, daughters, sisters of um, seafarers and uh, you learn how their lives were impacted by being still part of the maritime world despite not being at sea. Perfect. Well, those are all the questions that we have so far. If you have any further questions, I would encourage you to get in contact with us. So you can contact us uh, via our email address, which is info at amdigital.co.uk. You can also arrange a free trial of any of the collections that you have seen today once they publish. Um, and if you'd like any more information about Adam Matthew Digital or the collections that you've seen here today, pop over to our website, which is amdigital.co.uk.
and have a very nice day. Thank you very much.